Okay, so we're gonna go over stuff covered in chapter three or in test three, which is chapters chapters nine through twelve, which covers topics like elasticity. Stress, strain, static equilibrium, that's chapter nine there, chapter ten. This is the um, chapter on fluids. So we talked about Archimedes principle. We talked about Pascal's principle. talked about Bernoulli's uh, principle. A lot of principles in this chapter. Um, and I think that pretty much covers everything in chapter 10, except for some of the smaller topics like phases of matter and, and things like that. Um, for chapter 11, the topics were waves, right? So thing, um, <clears throat> things like frequency, uh, period, wavelength, right? And then there were some other topics in there, for example, the mass spring system, which has been kind of a recurring topic for us throughout the course mass spring system. We talked about the pendulum. And some other topics in there as well. Like, um, I believe the uh, energy transported by waves and things like that are also in there, but I consider those kind of like subtopics. So we'll talk about them as we need to. And then chapter 12, uh, we talked about sound. So um, just the biggest thing here, sound. So there's a couple different things that are important when discussing sound. One of the big ones is intensity, which is how much power output per unit area. Sound level, which is a nice mathematical definition, which allows us to kind of talk in a more human way about how loud sounds are. Um, in addition to that, we also talked about the Doppler effect, which is how the frequency that is observed by somebody who um, who is not at the source of a sound is different than what's observed at the source of the sound. So that's called the Doppler effect. And that frequency change is due to the motion of the source or the motion of the observer or both at the same time. Let's see, did I miss any topics there from chapter 12? Um, just double check here really quickly. I feel like there's one, um, one topic that's missing there from chapter 12.
Ah, yeah, okay, so um, interference. And this is actually kind of like, um, this, this topic's kind of uh, exists in between these two chapters here. So um, this has something just simply to do with waves, really. So this is kind of a wave topic. Let me just quickly double check, make sure I didn't miss anything um, important in some of these other chapters as well. So um, some of these topics are kind of like fringe topics that are not super important for um, kind of our, um, our plans for this class. We don't want to go into too much detail on any in any one specific um, topic and so if you actually look in the book section you know if a section is like half a page long then obviously that's something that I'm not going to test you guys on and I would expect you to um, spend a lot of time studying on that so avoid those sections in the book which are kind of like half a page long they're definitely interesting and, and worth a read when you have time but um, when you're studying for an exam you want to focus on the key topics, right? Okay, and there was one more topic from chapter 10. And that was um, gauge pressure. So in particular, gauge pressure is kind of important because um, it's how we measure pressure often. So let's add in gauge pressure there as something we should know for the test. And finally, let me just double check chapter nine here. I think chapter nine is good there. Yeah, so that should be good. So static equilibrium, stress strain, elasticity, that's pretty good. So these are the topics that I feel like you should focus on studying for the exam. Um, this is not every single topic in these four chapters, but I think this is mostly what I'll test you on. I don't think I'll ask anything outside of these topics here. And um, if I did, if I were to ask you uh, a question that kind of is a little bit outside one of these topics, then I would probably give you a little bit of help in answering that question, maybe give you um, like do this, you know, maybe use this formula and put that right in the question there. So, um, so worry mostly about these topics here. So these are the topics for test three. Okay, any questions about that? There's a couple of us here. Kevin or Ju, any questions about those topics there? Okay, I see a thumbs up from Kevin. Good, okay. All right, so um, here's what we'll do. I found questions from the homeworks that have a, let's say, not as high a score as other questions on the exam. Not necessarily people did bad on the questions, but just not everyone was able to get those uh, questions correct. And so I think that's maybe a good starting point, maybe a good warm up point to kind of get going here in the review session. So here's a problem that was kind of below average in terms of the amount of points that people got on it. Um, and so maybe this is a good starting point. This is chapter nine. And I'll just put this question out there first and then we can alternate. Maybe I give you guys a question and then I'll say, okay, do you guys have a question you wanna go over from this chapter? And then we can do it that way. Okay, so um, let's start with this question here. So we have a 50 story building uh, that's being planned and it's 190 meters high with a base 46 meters by 70 meters. Its total mass is 2.1 times 10 to the seven kilograms. And its weight therefore is about 2.1 times 10 to the eight Newtons. Suppose a 200 kilometer per hour wind exerts a force 
of 860 newtons per square meter over the 70 meter wide face. And so what it's saying here is FA here. Let's try to draw this a little bit. Um, maybe use this line drawing thing here. So there is a face to this building here. And in on this face here, there's an area associated with that. That's the area that that force is blowing on. I'm oh, sorry, that that wind is, is blowing on. And um, typically for uh, something like this, you would talk about the pressure on the side face of that building there. But in this particular question, or sorry, in this particular chapter, this came before we talked about pressure, right? So um, this question doesn't really, uh, have anything to do with that but you can imagine that if the wind is blowing uh, on the side of a building there's a pressure associated with that and so if you're if you have a really large building right you can get a very large force on the side of that building because uh, of a small pressure right remember um, pressure is force over area so even if you have a small pressure if you have a large area you get a large force now that's not relevant for this question though. Um, so we can actually uh, back things up here. That's that would be more relevant for topics in the next chapter when you actually talk about pressure. Okay, so what is this question asking us to do? It's asking us to determine um, the torque. And actually I forgot to write that down. It wants to know what the torque is about this pivot point right here at the bottom. So that's our pivot point right there. And so question for you, how would we calculate the torque about that pivot point there? How would we calculate the torque? What is a simple formula that we could use to calculate torque? Does anybody have an answer for me? Anybody who's here? How do we get torque? You see there's a chat here. Yeah, so force times some distance, some lever arm, we call it. Exactly. So we can use a an equation like this, force times lever arm. And we do have to remember that that force has to be perpendicular, right? It's got to be the perpendicular component. So a uh, conceptual question for... Um, those of us who are here, and maybe if you're watching online on YouTube, um, how much torque is exerted by the force Fe, this force down here at the bottom? How much force is, uh, sorry, how much torque is exerted on that point, the pivot point there, due to this force Fe? How much torque exerted at that pivot point due to this force Fe. So what is the torque due to Fe? Certainly there is a force there. We need to know what is the lever arm. Anybody have any ideas what the lever arm would be here?
Okay, we have a chat here. Not really sure about, um, okay, what it, what it would be the lever arm there at that point. What's the distance between the force and the point that we're calculating the torque? Half of the building's height. Uh, what point are we calculating the torque about? What point are we calculating the torque about? The pivot point, right? You always have to choose a point that you're going to calculate the torque about, right? You always have to choose the pivot point first. So our pivot point is down here at the bottom left of the building here. And we've got this force Fe, which acts at that pivot point. So what would the lever arm be? What's the distance between where the force is acting and the point right here? If the force is here like this, and the point that you're calculating the torque about is this point right here, then there's no lever arm here. The distance from where the force is acting and the point that you're calculating the torque about is zero. There's no lever arm, right? Another way to think about it, another way to think about it, let me go ahead and erase this because I want to draw maybe a better way. But suppose I have a, a rod here. So suppose I just have a ruler, okay? I pick up my ruler, I set it on the table, and I exert a force on the ruler like this. So this is my ruler. If I exert a force on the ruler like this, is the ruler going to rotate? Is the ruler going to rotate if I exert a force like this? Kevin says no. Jude, do you have uh, an answer? No, right. So it's not going to rotate. So if I were to try and calculate the torque here, first I have to choose a point. I have to, I have to choose a pivot point, right? I, I just have to in order to determine if this thing is going to rotate about that point. So suppose I choose this point right here as my pivot point. Then I think we can see that the force that's perpendicular, you might say, okay, the lever arm here, so the lever arm, the force, okay, from here to here, that's not where the force acts though. The force acts at the red point there on the side of the ruler, okay? So you have to know where the pivot point is. We have to choose a pivot point actually. Um, and then you have to know how far away that pivot point is from where the force acts. So in this case, L is zero because the force acts right there. And then you have to determine, is there a component of the force which is perpendicular to the lever arm? Well, in this case, when the lever arm is zero, you can't determine if the force is perpendicular or not. Okay. Suppose then I chose the pivot point to be over here. I should get the same answer. I should still be able to determine that this ruler will not rotate. So let's choose a second pivot point over here. Let's, let's call this one pivot two. Now the force is still acting over here on this side of the ruler. So our lever arm, which is the distance from where the force acts to the pivot point is L. Maybe it's one meter if this is a meter stick, right? Maybe it's 30 centimeters if this is like a, a foot long ruler. So now L is not zero. But the torque only deals with the perpendicular component of the force. Now, L is along the ruler, right? L is in this direction here, pointing from the pivot point to where the force acts. And the force is just in the opposite direction. So 
if L is in this direction and the force is in this direction, here's L as a vector, here's F as a vector, are these vectors perpendicular? No, they're in the same, they're, they're anti-parallel, right? They're anti-parallel. So there is no component that is perpendicular. If the force maybe was making an angle like this, then we could say, ah, okay, there is a component that is perpendicular, right? This component right there is perpendicular. And so there will be a torque. But in this case, at pivot point two, we've made it so that the lever arm is not zero, but it doesn't matter because the force is parallel to the lever arm or anti-parallel. So the perpendicular component of the force is zero. Okay. The perpendicular component of the force is zero. The lever arm, we're free to choose. We, we can pick a pivot point wherever we want to calculate the torque, but um, that doesn't always mean that there's, um, there's guaranteed to be a torque if we change where the pivot point is. Um, in this particular problem now, to just bring everything back to this problem that we have here of whether or not this building is basically going to collapse, right? If we have these large forces acting on this building, the, the logical question here is, is the building going to topple over, right? Um, we need to calculate the torque about some point. I'm going to delete this because we need space here. We need to calculate the torque about some point and probably the best point to calculate the torque about is actually the pivot point down here in the bottom left. Um, and the reason for that is because that force there, the force Fe is acting at an angle. Um, and since we're, we're free to choose our pivot point, we can choose our pivot point to be at that force. And what that does is it makes it so that the torque exerted about that pivot point by that force is zero. You might be thinking, oh, wait a minute, um, that doesn't, isn't that going to change my answer depending on where I choose my, my pivot point? And the answer is no, it will not change your answer. You can pick your pivot point anywhere uh, on this building and you will get the same answer because as you move the pivot point around, you change all of the torques um, uh, by all of the forces. So um, as you move the pivot point around, you have to remember that as you're changing the lever arm between the forces, but you're also changing their perpendicular components as well. And that ultimately balances it out. So you always get the same answer wherever you choose that pivot point. As long as you choose the pivot point to be, um, I was gonna say, as long as you choose the pivot point to be on the inside of the object, but actually even that's not true. Um, you, you'll still get the same answer even outside of the object. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and, and actually get into the, the question here now. So the other forces involved in the problem are the, uh, gravitational force, right? So we have mg acting downwards. And here's our pivot point over here. And I'll keep labeling the pivot point. Okay, so there's going to be a torque on the building due to this force, because I think we can clearly see here that um, this force is going to be perpendicular, right? So here's a right angle right here. So the force mg is perpendicular to the lever arm here. This distance right here is the lever arm. What is that lever arm distance though? How do we figure out that level uh, lever arm distance? Well, you have to go back and read the problem, right? So it says that the wind is acting on the side, which is 70 meters wide. So this side over here in the back 
is 70 meters. Right? So this uh, side right here is 70 meters. That means that this side right here in the front is 46 meters. And since the gravitational force acts at the midpoint, or rather the center of gravity, which we're going to assume in this problem is right in the middle, as they've drawn it here, the center of gravity is right in the middle there. Um, that's that L is going to be exactly half of that 46 meters. So L is 46 meters over two. What's 46 over two? That's 23 meters there for the lever arm for the, I don't need to box this actually, this is gonna change. So that's 23 meters for the lever arm there for the force MG. The next thing to remember is the direction. Um, torques uh, have direction, right? They tell you which way the object is going to rotate. So is the building going to topple over this way or is the building going to topple over this way, right? So it can go this way or it can go this way. So the direction is important. And if you remember, we um, talked about clockwise rotation versus counterclockwise rotation. And you need to pick clockwise or counterclockwise to be your positive direction. And then the other direction will be your negative direction. Before we uh, get into that, though, let's talk about this other force now. So this other force, FA, is acting in this direction. And that force is also has a perpendicular lever arm to our pivot point. So here's the pivot point here. This is the force FA. And so we need to know what the lever arm is here. That's the part that's perpendicular there to uh, the perpendicular distance to the uh, pivot point. Or you can think of it not necessarily over there from the side where the force is but you can think of it on the side where the pivot point is as well. So you could imagine that this force is acting here and this is the lever arm, but you can see that those are kind of two equivalent pictures there, right? So it's still the same lever arm and it's still the same force there. So however you wanna try and visualize that. Now this force acts halfway up the building and the building is 190 meters high. So building is 190 meters tall. Divide that by two since we're looking at the midpoint. And this gives us 95 meters for the lever arm there. Okay, 95 meters. Now we're ready to um, calculate the torques. Let me try to give myself some more space here. Move this over. Maybe move this there. Move this here. Move this here. And we're, we're really lacking some color here. So maybe things are getting a little bit cluttered. Here, let's put a line through these two here. And then I'll try to, um, okay, we established that the torque due to the force Fe is gonna be zero. So I'm gonna get rid of that. Try and clean up some space over here. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the net torque on this building. 
And there's a couple things I've already mentioned that we have to be careful of. We have to keep, be careful of the sign, right? So that's the number one thing. When we calculate the torque, we have to choose a direction that is positive torque and the other direction is going to be negative torque. So that's number one. Number two, how are we going to determine if the building topples or remains stable? Well, look at the figure. If, if the building is going to topple, then th there's got to be a really large force on it to knock it over, right? There's got to be a really large force on it to knock it over. So if the torque due to FA is bigger, so torque due to FA bigger, so if torque due to FA is bigger than the torque due to MG, then this thing is going to topple over. Okay, it's going to not it's going to get knocked down. It's going to the building is going to collapse. But if the torque due to FA is less than the torque due to MG, then that means that this building will not topple over, but it might not be entirely obvious why that's the case. So not topple over. Okay, so it will not topple. That might not be entirely obvious because what we're saying is that there's still a torque there, but the, the torque FA is just less than the torque due to MG. Well, you have to remember the direction of rotation here. So if FA is bigger than MG, then this thing wants to rotate in this direction, right? So it wants to topple the building over. Um, if that torque is not as big as the torque due to MG, then this building doesn't necessarily want to topple over because it's still connected here to the earth on this side here. So if the torque is such that it wants to go the other way, oops. So if the torque is such that it wants to go this way, well, actually that's not gonna happen because there are going to be reaction forces here that save the building. Okay, there's going to be a force on the bottom of the building here, which prevents it from toppling over. That's a react, that's a normal force, that's a reactionary force. So if it starts to topple to the right, uh, so if the, if, if the torques tell us that it's going to topple over to the right, then we have to remember that we haven't accounted for the force on the bottom right corner of the building, which will be there if the building is going to topple over to the right. Um, if the building is going to topple over to the left, then those forces would not be there because, well, if the building is going to topple over, it's no longer going to be making contact with the earth on that side. So that's the idea there. If the building is going to fall over, it won't be making contact with the bottom right corner. Um, if it's toppling over to the left, if it's toppling over to the right, then obviously the building is being is pushing against the ground on that side. Um, so that's the little explanation for um, whether or not it's going to topple. Okay, so let's, uh, oh, whoops, oops, okay bad on that. So let's, uh, let's clean this up now. Um, so we now know the condition for when it's going to topple and when it's not going to topple. Let's choose the um, positive direction for the torque to be in that direction, because that's the direction that the building will topple. Um, so by choosing that direction to be the positive direction, if the net torque is positive, the building will topple over. 
If the net torque is negative, the building will not topple over. So now we want to calculate the net torque. So we want to sum up the two torques that we have here in our problem. The positive torque will be FA times its lever arm. So the lever arm for FA minus the uh, force MG times its lever arm. And we don't necessarily know what uh, that is going to be equal to. So let us um, put a question mark there. Remember what I said that um, we're going to just determine if this number is positive or negative. So we're not putting equal zero in this case. We just want to know um, which of these uh, is bigger. So FA times uh, the lever arm for FA. Well, um, the force FA is given to us as a force per meter squared. So we actually do need to, uh, so actually that is in fact is a pressure that I mentioned before. So that's 860 Newtons per meter squared. We have to multiply that by the area of that face of the building there. So the area of the face there is 70 meters times 190 meters. Do they calculate those before constructing? Yeah, sorry, I missed your question. Um, do they calculate those before constructing a building? So the way that building, building construction um, works typically is that um, it's kind of like what we discussed in chapter, I believe it's at the end of chapter nine, things having to do with safety factors. So what you do is you construct the building in a way where um, it's allowed to move a little bit at the base. And um, you assume that that building is gonna withstand really large forces due to wind in order to calibrate that, uh, like how much that building should be able to wobble um, at the bottom. So typically like very large skyscraper buildings, they have this ability at the bottom to kind of shift their position and wobble a little bit. Um, and that helps protect against earthquakes and like massive wind storms if, if one uh, were to occur. Usually the design of a building um, you look at what are called like 100 year events. So um, you would look at like, what was the, the most ridiculous amount of wind that occurred in like the last 100 years um, and use that as a, uh, as kind of like a, um, your safety uh, measure there. So you want to design the building to make sure that you know, if you have some crazy windstorm that only occurs once every hundred years, that the building would be able to survive that. Same thing with like an earthquake. So, um, you know, you might, like in California, we have earthquakes, right? So your buildings would be designed in such a way to withstand a very rare earthquake event, right? Um, you know, maybe like the worst earthquake that ever occurred in like the last hundred years in California. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the idea there, uh, behind like constructing like these buildings like this, cause you have to take, you, you have to have extra safety measures, right? Because, um, you wouldn't want to build, uh, like a building, um, and then there's like some crazy natural disaster that happens and then it just like destroys the building. Right. Okay. So um, we need to calculate the total force on the side of this building here due to the wind. The wind is exerting a pressure on the side of the building, 860 Newtons per square meter. And the side lengths of that rectangle for that building is 70 meters by 190 meters. So we need to punch that in 
to a calculator. So I'll do that with Wolfram Alpha. So 70 times um, 190 here, uh, that's 13,300. 13,300 square meters. So one, three, three, zero, zero meters squared. That's gonna give us a force. So this, this right here is the force Fa. The product of those two is the force. Now the lever arm, Maybe I'll use red now. So the lever arm here was what we figured out already. Um, that was this 95 meters right here. So 95 meters for the lever arm, that's gonna give us the torque due to the force FA. I'm gonna subtract from that now mg times the lever arm for mg. So the mass of a building is, is something that's you know quite large. So they give it to us as in scientific notation, 2.1 times 10 to the eight newtons. Or, uh, oh yeah, newtons. Okay, so they actually give us the weight. We don't actually have to calculate uh, mass times, uh, we don't have to calculate mg. We just use the value of the weight that they've given us. Right. Anytime you see a value given to you in newtons, right? That's that's a force, or um, weight is a force, right? Okay. So uh, times the lever arm there for um, the lever arm there for the uh, weight uh, of the building, we found that to be twenty three meters. Twenty three meters there. And now we simply need to calculate these two numbers here. So get out your calculators and follow along. 860 times 13,300 times 95 minus 2.1 times 10 to the eight times 23. And I come out with a negative number I come up with a negative number here and it makes quite a lot of sense because the actual weight of this building is so large compared to the force uh, due to the wind here. So what I get for the number, again, double check me on this, make sure I haven't made a mistake here in the calculator, is roughly uh, minus 3.7 times 10 to the nine Newton meters. So units of torque are Newton times a meter. Um, so double check, I didn't make a mistake there, but uh, I believe this answer is a pretty good answer because if we just did an order of magnitude approximation, what we would find is that the torque due to the force FA is Roughly, let's see, let's take a look here. This, in, I'll do it all in brown here. So this right here is, uh, or sorry, this one is not due to FA. This one right here is 10 to the power two, right? Approximately. The force um, uh, or the pressure uh, uh, that is exerting the force, the wind here is roughly 10 to the third, right? Roughly a thousand Newtons per meter squared. And then the area here is roughly 10 to the um, uh, uh, 10 to the fourth here. Um, let's see, does that uh, does that work out here? Yeah, I think that that should be good. Um, so the uh, torque there, due to um, did I? I'm wondering if I made a. a I guess uh, I, don't know, I guess it just works out this way. So the um, order of magnitude here for the torque due to the force um, FA is on the order of 10 to the 9. OK, 
okay, on the order of 10 to the 9. And over here, for the torque due to the gravitational force, the weight here, is about 10 to the 8 and uh, about 10 to the 1 here. And so that torque is about 10 to the 9. And so the uh, torque due to FA and the torque due to the weight are of the same order of magnitude um, by doing this order of magnitude approximation. However, it just so happens that the, uh, the torque due to the uh, gravitational force is just, is just larger. And so this comes out to a negative answer here. Um, it, it's, it seems like the, the torque due to mg is roughly four times bigger, just eyeballing it here, um, because we end up with uh, roughly negative 3.7. 2.1 times 23 is going to give you something like 46, right? Um, and then minus, uh, minus this uh, piece over here. So, okay, so they're of the same order of magnitude, but one is clearly, you know, a couple times bigger than the other one, so we end up with a negative answer. Um, okay, so Kevin, that's what you got as well, good. So uh, what what is there left now to do for this question? Well, is to analyze the answer, right? So we got a negative answer, and we said, if the answer was negative, the building would not topple over because the torque due to mg was larger than the torque due to fa. So the wind isn't blowing hard enough to knock the building over. The wind isn't blowing hard enough to knock the building over, so it does not topple. Okay. Any questions about that question there? Any questions? Kevin, do you have any questions? No questions? Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to the next question there that I have here. Um, now, the next question that I have here is about gauge pressure. Um, maybe before we um, go into the next chapter, maybe, maybe, um, maybe those of you who are here right now have a question related to torque. Maybe you want to see um, another type of torque question before we actually move on to another chapter so maybe that would be a good time to stop and ask you guys that so do we want to see like another question involving torques or that was probably a good enough review we can also talk about um kind of the general ideas of the chapter so uh, the static equilibrium chapter chapter nine So here's maybe a question for you guys. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, also ask yourself this question, see if you can answer this before I show the answer. So what are the conditions what are the conditions for static equilibrium. What are the conditions for static equilibrium? So let's see if, uh, if anybody who's here can give me an answer. What are the conditions for static equilibrium? 
Oh, okay, so we have an answer in the chat. So net force and net torque are both equal to zero. So do we agree with that? Let me write that out. So net torque, we can write it like this, right? Net torque equals zero. And we can write net force. And I'll put a vector sign over the uh, net force because force is a vector. Torque is also a vector, but we always deal with um, two dimensional um, systems um, in this class. We could deal with three dimensional systems, in which case we would need to account for the fact that the torque is a vector. Um, but for this class, we do everything in 2D. So we worry about force as a vector, but we look at um, torque as a plus or a minus, right? It's like a one dimensional vector. It's either positive or negative, depending on how it's gonna rotate an object. So do we all agree with that? So think about that, pause the video and think about that if you're watching on YouTube. Well, hopefully you paused it before I gave the answer. Um, yeah, so these are the correct conditions here for static equilibrium, okay? If we wanna write it out, what the net torque is, we could write a summation of all torques and we should maybe choose a direction, maybe counterclockwise to be positive and say that that equals zero. And we could choose a direction for positive torques, right? We could do an X and we could do a Y. Whoops, I forgot to write the force there. Both of these equal zero. And maybe we could say this direction is positive and maybe we could say this direction is positive for the, um, the forces there, right? Okay, um, so there's that's kind of like the general idea there for chapter nine. There's some other stuff in chapter nine, obviously, that you should know. Go over all of the topics there that we listed in the beginning. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, a, another question here. So this is a question related to pressure. The gauge pressure in each of the four tires of an automobile is 240 kilopascals. If each tire has a footprint of 170 centimeters square, what do they mean by footprint? They mean the area of the tire that's touching the ground. Determine the mass of the car. Express your answer to two significant figures and include the appropriate units. So we're told that an automobile has four tires. Let's look at one tire, but remember there are four of these tires, four tires. Okay. The area here, the area here that makes contact with the ground is 170 centimeters squared. The whole weight of the tire, excuse me, <laughs> the whole weight of the car, of the automobile, has to be supported by the tires, right? So the whole weight of the car is on these tires. whole weight of the car is on those tires. What other force is also on the tires? What other force is also acting on the tires? Let's see, do we have some chats? Not yet, no chats yet. If you're watching the recording, think about that. What's the other force that's on the tire here? There must be at least one more force, right? 
otherwise the car would be falling down through the road, right? All the way towards the center of the earth. Um, torque, is there a torque on the tire? Well, the car is not, the car is not moving anywhere, right? It's just resting. It doesn't really say that in the problem, but um, matter of fact, it doesn't actually matter if the car is at rest or not. Normal force, there we go. So that's kind of what I was getting after. Now the normal force is acting on the tire, certainly, but what is the normal force how do we handle the normal force if we have four tires? How do we handle the normal force if we have four tires? Maybe we could say, maybe we could say that um, the normal force is, you know, uh, or the, the weight of the car is evenly distributed on all four of the tires, right? And so the normal force on each of those tires has to match the, um, the portion of the weight that acts on that tire. So all four of the um, normal forces on the tire would have to add up to mg, right? Um, so I like the answer normal force, but um, it's not exactly what we need for this problem. Although, yes, it is true. It is true that there are normal forces here. What about the pressure? We haven't, we haven't talked about the pressure in the tires, right? So where does that normal force come from? Where does that normal force come from? Tire pressure, right? Tire pressure because the automobile, the, the tires have this pressure and this much of the uh, tires are making contact to the ground, right? And so it's the tires that are pushing down on the road and then of course the road pushing back up on the tires, right? So that's the, um, the action reaction pair there, the normal forces. Uh, between the two surfaces there. So the weight of the car has to be equal to four times, why the four? Because we have four tires, four times the pressure in the tire Pascal is a Newton per meter squared, times the area, the footprint of the tire, the area that is in contact with the road to convert that pressure into a force. And that is um, 0 0.0170 meters squared, just converting that number there in my head. So uh, centimeters squared is the same as 10 to the minus four meters squared. Um, so the weight of the car is equal to four times the force exerted by one of the tires. Okay, so one of the tires exerts a force um, equal to the pressure times the, the footprint that they call it here, um, the amount of surface area that makes contact with the road. So um, we need to multiply those numbers out, right? Four times 240 
times 10 to the third times 0 0.0170. Wait, why am I getting a negative number? Oh, um, I accidentally did not remember to erase that. There we go. So what I get here for my number and ch double check your calculator, 16,320. Um, and that would be units of Newtons. So we get that the weight is 16,320 Newtons. Well, now what we have to do is determine the mass. And we know that weight is mass times the gravitational acceleration. And so we can simply divide this thing by 9.8 meters per second squared. And what we end up with, divide by 9.8 is six, uh, one, 1,665 kilograms. Okay, does that, uh, does that make sense? That there's probably a couple points there in that question that might be, you know, maybe you guys have questions, so let me know. Are there any questions for that one? The idea here is that, of course, the tire pressure has to support the weight of the car. But pressure and weight don't have the same units, right? Pressure is Newtons per meter squared. And uh, right, the weight is going to be in Newtons. So they give you this footprint idea, which is how much of the tire is making contact with the road. And then you can take that pressure and, you know, quote unquote, convert it to a force, right? Um, I never actually wrote this down. Uh, force is equal to pressure times area, right? So pressure times area to get the force. Okay, so we'll go ahead and um, I'll open it up again. Are there any questions, any kind of pressure related questions that we wanna take a look at? Before we go to the next question, I have a question again for you, those of you who are here and then once I state the question, you can pause if you're watching on YouTube. Um, let me type this one out to save some time. So this is a conceptual question. What has the larger buoyant force? A standard balloon filled with helium or an elephant. Just due to the air in the atmosphere, right? The air in the atmosphere is a fluid and anything in any fluid experiences a buoyant force. So if you're watching the video, the recording, pause it now and think about this question. Um, don't go and Google anything like that, right? Um, try to reason out um, the answer. If you have to review, if you don't remember what buoyant force is, then you can 
obviously go open up the book and review what buoyant force is and then take a crack at this question here. So again, I'll read the question. What has the larger buoyant force due to the air in the atmosphere? A standard balloon filled with helium or an elephant? Okay, pause the video and try and answer that question. Those of you who are here, go ahead and put an answer in the chat. I'll give you a minute or so to think about that. So we have disagreement here in chat. So this is a good, um, I think this is a really good opportunity for the two of you to discuss and maybe try and convince the other person um, that your answer is correct. So um, maybe uh, who wants to go first, you know, that kind of thing. So. So we have one student says elephant, one student says balloon. Maybe you can both type up um, some reasoning, um, tell each other the reason why you chose your answer. I'll go ahead and pause the recording now, that way uh, it's not as long. Okay, so we had um, some good discussion there, some different ideas. Um, the key point here is that the buoyant force depends on the volume of fluid that is displaced. So volume of fluid that is displaced. Okay, so an elephant, uh, the size of an elephant, right? So the volume of an elephant is much bigger than the volume of the balloon. Yes, the balloon wants to rise and the elephant does not want to rise, but that has to do with the net force on the elephant and the net force on the balloon. Buoyant force is only one of the forces that is acting on each of these two objects. And we need to know the net force in order to determine whether the object um, rises or kind of stays put on the ground. Um, so you have to be able to differentiate between that. So buoyant force is not necessarily the net force on an object. It's the volume of fluid, uh, excuse me, it's the weight of the volume of fluid that is displaced. So I actually, I didn't even write that correctly. So it's the weight of volume of fluid that is displaced. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and go on to another question. Now, I believe this question also has to do with fluids. Yes, indeed it does, um, although the question is kind of cut off here. Let's uh, grab this word right here, or these two words, and put them here, and everything should fit good. There we go. Um, so we have a, a situation where a physician wants to measure the blood pressure of a patient. Okay, suppose the patient is standing up a physician judges the health of a heart by measuring the pressure with which it pumps blood. If the physician mistakenly attaches the pressurized cuff around a standing patient's calf, kind of silly, um, about 0.82 meters below the heart, instead of the arm, 
What error in Pascal's would be introduced in the heart's blood pressure measurement? Express your answer using two significant figures. Okay, so we have a question where we're asked to determine basically the amount of error in the measurement of blood pressure. Um, what concept here is at play? So if I if I put up uh, one of these cuffs around my arm, then the cuff is at the same height as the heart, right? So the cuff is here, the heart. Yeah, the heart is about right here, right? So this is Here's a makeshift heart that I'm drawing here. So maybe it's a little bit higher, but um, the heart is at the same height as the cuff. Okay, so um, I don't know if we want to call this, uh, let's call this zero. And the patient's calf, let's say, is down here. So if we put the cuff on the calf, that cuff is located a distance 0 0.82 meters below the arm, below the heart. So what principle is at play here? Any ideas? So any equations maybe involving pressure and height? If I, um, if, I'm, if I go to the beach and I'm swimming at the top of the water and then I dive down, I swim down into the ocean, um, does the pressure increase or does it decrease or does it stay the same? If I dive into the ocean, the pressure increases. Is there uh, maybe um, is there maybe an equation or something that we developed that describes how the pressure increases as we dive deeper? I like it. So rho g h, right? Rho g h, and where does that equation come from? Where does that equation rho gh come from? Well, if you look at the rho times g part, that has a little something to do with the weight of the fluid. Not exactly, right? Because it's density times g. So it's, uh, it's really weight per unit volume. But um, as we go further and further down uh, in, into the ocean, we're displacing, um, or excuse me, uh, as we go further and further down into the ocean, we have more and more water above us, right? We have more and more of that fluid up above us. And all of the weight of that fluid is pushing down on us now. Okay, so there's if we if we dive really deep into the ocean, there's a lot of water above us. All that water is pushing down on us, the weight of that water acting on 
basically uh, every every spot on our body. So that's why this equation, uh, that's where we get this equation from. So we consider, um, we consider a small uh, object going deeper into the ocean and we see that all of the weight of the water above that object is pushing on that object. Okay, and that's encapsulated by this formula right here that the pressure, and by the way, this is a pressure increase here. So I really should put delta, um, delta P and I should put a delta H over here. So let's maybe fix that real quick. And our delta H here, that's the height, um, or sorry, that's the distance that the calf is away from the heart. Okay, so the distance that that calf is away from the heart, that is our um, 0.82 meters. What's the density of blood? Well, the book gives the density of blood. So let's maybe write that down. The density of blood is about 1.050 kilogram per meter cubed. Um, or excuse me, a uh, thousand. One thousand, uh, yeah, 1,000 kilograms per meters. Per meter cubed. Uh, let me double check that real quick. Um, yeah, yeah, thousand. That's right. Yeah, water is a thousand kilograms per meters cubed. Now I'm kind of remembering. So the density of blood is just a little bit more dense than than uh, density of blood is a little bit more dense than water. Okay, so now we have everything we need to really answer this question here. So the amount of error in blood pressure is going to be this 1050 and I'll just plug this in without units here times 9.8 for G and then times the change in height here because the physician put it on the calf instead of the arm. So we can plug all these numbers in. We end up with an answer, 8,437.8 pascals. We need to round this off to some number of sig figs. Let's go with three. So let's say this is 8.44 kilopascals. Eight point four four kilopascals. And so we've added, you know, several thousand kilopascals of error in the measurement of the blood pressure simply due to the fact that you're measuring the pressure at the wrong location, at a location you know, roughly a meter below the heart. So probably the obvious question here is, how does this compare to the actual blood pressure that's measured? And that was not provided in the question, but I think that's a good thing that maybe we could Google right now. And I have a value here now for blood pressure. There are a couple types here. Um, okay, then I'm getting like an ad there. Let me go to, yeah, let's go to the wiki page here. Okay, so where is it again? Um, here we go. So um, there is a there's a, what's called um, what is it called again? Uh, uh, 
systolic blood, blood pressure, which is the highest blood pressure when, when your heart gives the, the strongest, um, the strongest beat. And then there's the lower blood pressure when, um, when the heart uh, has like the weaker um, beat. And so there's systolic. Um, blood pressure. And this one is uh, 16 kilopascals. And then there's a diastolic. And this, of course, is a gauge pressure. Okay, don't forget that this is, of course, a gauge pressure. It has to be because atmospheric pressure is like 101 kilopascals, right? So this is uh, pressure above atmospheric pressure. The diastolic is 11 kilopascals. So that's a significant error there that's being added to your blood pressure measurement, right? That's like for systolic blood pressure, that's like 50% error, right? And over here, that's like 70% error or something like that. Uh, or 80, oh yeah, actually like closer to 80% error. So um, yeah, that's a that's a huge amount of error for your blood pressure measurement. Okay, so always make sure that you measure the um, the blood pressure at the level of your heart, and so your arm is a good location for that because it's at the same height as the heart. Okay, any questions about that question there? Close some of those. Okay, so if there's no questions, we can go um, maybe to the next problem I have here, which is a question about waves and how waves interfere. So this is interference of waves here. I can pull this a little bit closer over here and then zoom in, that's probably better. We can forget about um, part two for a second and we'll answer part two here in a, in a second. So we have two pulses shown in the figure and they're moving towards each other. Which of the four choices here accurately represents the interference of the waves as they cross paths? So which of these four choices accurately represents the interference of the two waves as they cross paths? If you're watching on YouTube, uh, uh, just pause the video now and give this one a shot. I'm gonna pause the recording, so I'll be back. Uh, in a, just a blink of an eye. Okay, we're, we're back. The recording uh, resumes now. So um, we discussed the question. We found that both A and D are possible. Okay, and in this particular homework question, which is where I grabbed this question from, homework 11, part one, um, uh, question 11.48, um, a is the correct answer for part A, which asks you what the interference pattern looks like when the two waves are perfectly overlapped um, when they first meet each other. Um, and then part B is to identify what that interference looks like a moment later. So a little bit of time passes after they're perfectly overlapped. And that would be answer C for part B. Um, if you look at the answers for part A, though, we determined that D could also be possible, except this isn't when they perfectly overlapped. This is a moment after they were perfectly overlapped. So really, uh, it could be A or D here in this first part. And if you wanted to break it down in the homework, they broke it down into two parts. So it was this one for um, the second part. Now, just a quick reminder, um, what do you do for questions like this? Um, you imagine that the two waves are almost like functions 
um, that you're plotting um, and you plot them on top of each other. So you imagine something like this and maybe this red function is f of x and this black function here is g of x and you simply plot f of x plus g of x. So over here, what we would see for f of x plus g of x is something which looks like this. And you could actually test this with um, different um, like shapes of functions and stuff. So this is basically f of x plus g of x. And that really is how waves interfere. They simply add like that. So if you have negative parts, that's subtracting from the positive parts. So if you have multiple positive parts, then they would add together. So let's just quickly look at an example for that. So if I had a, a red wave, which looked like this, okay, and then maybe um, let's do a blue wave. And the blue wave looked like, um, let's say it looked like this. And the blue wave is headed this way. And the red wave is headed this way. Okay, well, first off, if I were to plot this um, before the two waves began interfering, then it would simply look like this. It would just look like two kind of positive um, lumps there. And so just it's just up and then it comes back to zero and then up again. But as these two start to interfere, what it's going to look like is like this. So you're going to see something like this. Whoops, I right clicked while I was doing that and it erased it. So it's going to look something like this. Notice that the peaks are, are coming closer to each other and the middle region there is starting to add up. And what will happen here now? So they're they're still moving closer to each other. So now what we'll see is like, okay, now we're starting to get like a bigger peak here. And the peak will start to thin out as they perfectly overlap. And then when they perfectly overlap, it's going to look something like this. And you know, a lot of what's wrong with this drawing is just because I can't draw it very well with my mouse here. So um, the peaks start to come into one another, and as they come into one another, they add up and become a bigger peak. And then what happens is the two begin to um, get away from each other again. And then let's go over here for the next one. And then eventually it will just be those two peaks again, and they'll be moving away from each other as they've, they've already interfered, and then they begin to move away from each other. So let's indicate the direction of the velocity here for these peaks. So the peaks are still moving towards each other here in these in, in these images. And now what you have is the two peaks after they've um, they have the complete constructive interference there. Um, so just to just to put a name to this, this is uh, this is constructive interference here. They're adding up. As a matter of fact, all of these are constructive interference um, because the waves are adding up. Here we have what's called destructive interference because we have the waves kind of canceling each other out a little bit. Destructive interference. So in this region, uh, in this region right here, um, where we have that kind of short negative peak there, um, there's destructive interference. The two waves are working against each other, so to speak. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's how you determine what the waves look like um, when they interfere is it's really, it's just add up each of the parts. You can think of them as functions and, and add them as functions, right? Um, yeah, 
So any questions about that before we go to the next question? So I'll open it up for you guys. Ask me any questions you might have. No questions so far, okay. Okay, so nobody has any questions, so we'll go ahead and go on to the next question now. And it looks like we'll have to bring this over. And maybe I have to bring this over here so we can see. So we have a question now from the chapter 12 material. So we've gone all the way down from nine to 12 now, the last chapter. We have a plot here which shows the sensitivity of the human ear as a function of frequency. What is the lowest frequency that an ear can detect when the sound level is 40 decibels? So 40 decibel sound level, that's like a, that's like a soft conversation with, uh, you know, with somebody kind of nearby. You're in a quiet room and you're talking to your friend. You're, no, you're not really loud. You're not really quiet either. You're not whispering. It's kind of like a gentle conversation. So when the sound level is 40 decibels, what is the lowest frequency that an ear can detect, a human ear? Well, we have to read the plot. So we have the sound level on the y-axis here, and we have the frequency on the x-axis. So we can see if we find the 40 decibel line, we find the 40 decibel line, I'll go ahead and use blue here. Here's 40 decibels right here. And I'll actually use the line drawing function here. So here is 40 decibels right here. What is the lowest frequency that we can hear? We have some choices, 30 to 40 hertz, about 700 hertz, about 80 to 90 hertz, about 200 hertz. Well, where does the line cross the threshold of hearing? Wherever the line crosses the threshold of hearing, that means we can barely hear it. That's what threshold of hearing means. So what would you guys say for the frequency that we could hear at 40 decibels? What's the, the lowest frequency? So here's 100. There's 100 right there. So what would you guys say? Go ahead and put put your answer in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. And you guys uh, watching on YouTube, go ahead and try and answer this one as well. I'll be back quickly. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to find the frequency that corresponds to where the blue line meets the red line. And you can see here that that's going to be just below 100 hertz. So the answer here that we get for this one is about 80 to 90 hertz, okay? Okay, we have a follow-up question. What is the highest frequency that an ear can detect when the sound level is 40 decibels? Highest frequency, 700 to 1,000, 10,000, 5,000 to 6,000, or higher than 17,000? Okay, so what is the highest frequency? All right, so what we do is again, we come over to our plot here. We're looking at the 40 decibel line. We're looking for the highest frequency that we can hear. Highest frequency. We wanna know where the 
blue line crosses the um, where the blue line crosses the red line. But unfortunately, in this figure, it's a little bit ambiguous. Um, it's ambiguous because the red line ends here, right? So the red line ends here, but presumably this red line would kind of come up somewhere over here, right? And um, all of these red lines would kind of maybe come up over here, do something like this, right? And maybe, maybe a lot of them are kind of going up like this and you can't really hear too much sound beyond um, a certain frequency here. So it kind of just, they all kind of go up at some point. Okay, so let's look at our options then. This is like one of those questions where we have to kind of check our options to really be able to answer the question. So 700 to 1,000 hertz, where is 700 to 1,000? Well, it's right around here, right? In this region, right? Okay, well then that answer doesn't really make that much sense, right? That's, I mean, clearly, um, the frequency that we can hear at 40 decibels is much larger than that, right? So I'll let you guys um, evaluate the rest of those answers. Here's what I'll do. I'll grab these answers and I'll move them up here so that we can see our new answers. Okay, so go ahead and try this question if you're watching the video um, uh, on YouTube. I'm going to pause the recording now. Okay, so we're back and what we kind of figured out here was that we kind of have to assume that at this stage here, we have a 5000 Hertz frequency there 10,000 here. So this must be 15,000 um, Hertz there. Um, and so just based on what I kind of sketched here, the red lines, it seems like maybe higher than 17,000 is our best answer because certainly it's bigger than it, it's bigger than than um, the 10,000. So let's say greater. So so um, 10,000 is less than um, the answer here. We know the answer is uh, is got to be uh, maybe around 15,000 or more. Um, again, this one 5,000 is 5,000 to 6,000 is like in this region right here somewhere in this region here in this black box that I've drawn. Um, so that's that's less than our answer. So the only plausible answer here is this one. Um, obviously, we talked about the 700 to 1000 Hertz is in red right here. So this is our best answer right here. And it kind of makes sense because um, the human ear can hear about up to 20,000 Hertz. And so if you're talking about 40 decibels, 40 decibels is quite a low volume, low intensity sound. So um, maybe the answer is less than 20,000. Um, yeah, so um, we'll go ahead and I believe that's the last question I had prepared there. So I don't have any other questions prepared on my side. So now I'm opening the floor up to students. And here again is the list of topics, basically, that's going to be covered on the exam. Um, and so now I'm leaving it up to the students who are here to guide the review session. Um, if we work on some problems and, um, and you guys are feeling uh, comfortable, then maybe I can come up with a question. Um, but for the most part, I'd like to answer your questions and anything you would uh, anything you would like to see in particular. So I'll give you some time to think about that. I'll go ahead and pause the recording just to save time on the recording and I'll be back uh, when we have a question. Okay, so we discussed it and what we're going to do is we're going to do um, this question right here from homework 12 part two, um, number three, and then we'll take a look at Bernoulli's principle specifically. And then um, with all the time that we have left, we'll take a look at some random questions from the test review assignment. Okay, so let me find that homework 12 part two number three. Let's go ahead and pull that up. Homework 
12, part two, question number three. And let me go ahead and type out the problem statement uh, by hand here so I can have the larger text. We want to zoom in on it. So a bat flies toward a moth at speed 8.0 meters per second while the moth is flying toward the bat at speed 5.9 meters per second. The bat emits a sound wave of 50.13 kilohertz. What is the frequency of the wave detected by the bat after that wave reflects off the moth. Okay. So um, this is a two part question here. Um, the first thing that we need to do is we need to figure out the frequency that is observed by the moth. So the frequency that is observed by the moth is according to the Doppler effect. The frequency emitted by the source, that would be the bat. And then times this factor, which has to do with the velocity of sound, uh, the, excuse me, the speed of sound, the speed of the observer, and the speed of the bat. And it goes like this. So we have the speed of sound, which we use no subscript for, um, plus the speed of the observer over the speed of sound minus the speed of the source. And we always remember that if the source is moving toward, or if the um, observer is moving toward, then this means positive sign for the speed. And if they're moving away, this means negative sign, okay? So it's not like, you know, vectors in the normal sense. This is not vectors here. We have to remember that if it's toward, it's positive. If it's away, it's negative. And it's just something that you actually have to remember. There's no other way unless you want to re-derive the equation every time you do a Doppler effect problem. Um, so you have to remember toward is plus, away is minus. So in this case, both the bat and the moth are, are moving towards one another, right? So since they're both moving towards one another, um, what happens is we always plug in a positive sign, okay? The speed of sound can always be taken to be 343 meters per second when it's not given to you, or you're not being asked to calculate it based on the temperature, okay? So at 20 degrees Celsius, it's always 343 meters per second. Um, if they, if a question is like, if, 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 if a question says, and the ambient temperature is 15 degrees Celsius, then they're expecting you to calculate the speed of sound. Okay. All right, so um, the bat is the source and the moth is the observer for the first part of the question. When the frequency, or sorry, the wave reaches the moth, okay? So the, the wave is emitted by the bat and then it reaches the moth. All right, so what do we have here? Well, the frequency is 50.13, I believe it was 50.13 kilohertz. The speed of sound is 343 meters per second plus a positive number for the velocity or the speed of the observer, which is the moth. The moth is moving with a speed of 5.9 meters per second. And again, that is a positive value there. The speed of sound always goes into this equation as a positive value. So that's maybe one thing that you've also noticed doing some of these Doppler effect problems. 
Um, and now minus in the denominator, the speed of the source with a positive sign again, because it's moving toward the, um, the observer. So the source is moving toward the observer. So positive 5.9 for the speed of the bat there, uh, meters per second. Okay, so notice the minus sign is still there in the denominator. We've plugged in a positive value for the speed of the source and the minus sign is still there. That is how it works, okay? Do not change that minus sign to a plus sign. Leave it there as is. Okay, so um, at this stage, we just need to make a calculation now to get the frequency observed by the moth. So let's go ahead and do that in our calculators now. Um, don't worry about the kilohertz, just put your answer in terms of kilohertz. So we can leave the kilohertz off. We don't need to convert that for the time being, 5.9. So 343 plus 5.9 on the top, on the bottom, make sure you put parentheses, it's going to be 343 minus 5.9. And what I end up with, and you check me, um, are we recording? Yeah, we're recording, good. So you check me uh, if you're watching the video as well, I get 51.88 kilohertz. Okay, so my answer has units of kilohertz because I didn't convert the kilohertz from um, the emitted frequency, the, the bats, the, the bat, the, the frequency that the bat emitted. So um, once we get this answer, now the question becomes, okay, the bat sent out a wave toward the moth, and then that wave was reflected off of the moth. And so now the moth becomes the source of the wave and the bat is now observing the wave that was reflected off of the moth, okay? So now the bat is the observer and the moth is the source. So this is the frequency observed by the moth and the frequency observed by the moth is now going to be the, the source frequency for part for the second part here for the reflected wave. Okay, and that's maybe the tricky part on this question. Okay, so now since the moth is the source, the bat is observing that frequency that is reflected off of the moth. So V plus V O over V minus Vs. But of course, now the velocity of, uh, sorry, the speed of the observer, it's now the speed of the bat, right? And the speed of the source is now the speed of the moth. So it kind of flipped on us there because of the reflection. So uh, now that that is uh, now that we've established that I'll go ahead and drop the subscripts now so the frequency uh, observed is the frequency of the source. Uh, times uh, speed of sound plus uh, speed of the observer over speed of sound minus uh, speed of the source there. And now the observer here, the speed uh, of the observer that's the bat the bat speed is 5.9 meter. Oh, you know what, guys? I did make a mistake on this question. I did make a mistake on this question. Look, I plugged in 5.9 on accident instead of eight meters per second here. So eight meters per second, 
that should have been the velocity of the source for the bat. So it should have been right here. It should have been 8.0. So let's go ahead and recalculate that before we move to the next part. So I'll go ahead and I'll fix it over here. So replace the 5.9 with an 8.0. And actually I get 52.21. 52.21 here. 52.21 kilohertz. And that is the, um, the frequency that is reflected off of the moth. Okay, so back down here, the frequency, or sorry, the velocity or the speed of the observer, it's the speed of the bat. That's, that's why I caught my mistake there because I forgot what it was. I had to scroll back up and read the question. It should have been eight meters per second. Should have been eight meters per second. You can see it right there. So that was a mistake in the first part. So we just need to change this value right here. It's still positive. The bat is still moving toward the moth. Still moving toward the moth. Okay, so I think that was enough time for you guys to catch up on that. So we're coming back down here now. We're plugging stuff in now. So. We want to know the frequency observed by the bat and the frequency that is reflected off of the moth is now our source. That's 52.21 kilohertz. Speed of sound 343 meters per second plus the velocity or the, the speed of the observer, which is now the bat, so plus a positive 8.0 meters per second. In the denominator, we have 343 meters per second minus a positive 5.9 meters per second. That 5.9 is the speed of the moth, okay? So calculating this answer now. I come out with 54.36 kilohertz. And let me just double check that I didn't make a mistake again this time. So um, frequency of the source now is uh, the wave that's reflected off of the moth. So that's gonna be the 52.21. And then the observer is the bat, that's the eight meters per second there. And the source is now the moth due to the reflection. That's the 5.9. So this should be correct here. 54.36 kilohertz. <clears throat> so a bat can actually determine how far away a, um, and, uh, you know, like where, um, a bat can determine how far away uh, an object is, um, and also where it's headed by this, uh, these, um, um, like it has a sonar, right? It basically emits these waves and the bat uh, knows the speed of sound. So it can tell by based on how long it takes for the wave to come back to it, for it to detect the wave again, it can determine how uh, far away something is. And then based on the frequency that it detects, it can determine where that, object is headed, right? So that's why, um, you know, bats, which are nocturnal, right? They can, uh, you know, they can live in real dark caves and they can hunt at night and, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Any questions about this, uh, this problem here? Was this, um, was this good enough? Uh, 
uh, Kevin, did this uh, help? Okay, that's good. Um, so now we'll go ahead and cover a Bernoulli, um, a Bernoulli question. So I need to log back into Mastering over here because it logged me out. Let's see here. Okay, so I'm still on the textbook. All right, so we need to go to uh, chapter 10. We need to look at a uh, question involving Bernoulli's equation. Okay, so um, let me just give a quick overview of Bernoulli. So Bernoulli basically is a statement of, of um, how fluids flow uh, in, let's say, like a pipe, okay? So suppose that we have some fluid flowing in a pipe like this. And I'll go ahead and make this blue here. Um, oh, I see why it like bugged out on me there for a second. There we go. Um, I need to like close this little gap right here probably if I wanna do that. Um, here we go. So we have this fluid, maybe it's water flowing in this pipe here um, and it's flowing in this direction here like so. Um, if we were to look at a section of this pipe, maybe a section of a small length delta L. Well, the pipe has a cross-sectional area A, right? And presumably there's some pressure here. Um, there's some sort of pressure that's pushing um, the fluid along the pipe, right? So think, uh, you know, think of your, your faucet, right? There has to be pressure there. Um, in order to force the fluid to come out of your faucet in the sink because atmospheric pressure is also pushing on that fluid. So you have to have atmospheric pressure plus some extra pressure so that the fluid comes out of the, the faucet. And basically what Bernoulli um, says is that when you have a pipe like this, um, the flow of fluid uh, the, uh, essentially the mass of fluid that's flowing, um, it, it must remain, uh, let me, hold on. So let me, let me, let me phrase this uh, more precisely. So um, Bernoulli's equation really is a statement of conservation of energy. Okay. So if an amount of fluid, let's say here in this region right here, if there's an amount of fluid here in this region, let's see how much fluid would be in that region. Well, there's a volume associated with that region, which is A times delta L, right? And there's a, um, there is a, uh, a pressure that is associated here with this system. So let's say a pressure here, pressure P, And what Bernoulli says is that if you have a pressure um, in a pipe like this, then there's work done on the fluid as that fluid is moved through that, um, that distance delta L. And so you can think about how much work is done. Well, work is a force done over a distance, so a force exerted on something over a distance delta L. And there is no force here, but there is a pressure, right? So pressure can usually be written as force over area. So we can replace force with pressure times area. And then the amount of work that's done on that fluid becomes the pressure times the cross-sectional area 
times the length delta L here. Okay. So the amount of work that's done in moving the fluid, a section of the fluid through a, uh, a displacement, <clears throat> excuse me, a displacement delta L is the pressure times the cross-sectional area times that small length element, that small little bit of length along the pipe delta L. Okay. Now you could imagine asking how much a fluid might flow through another region of the pipe. Suppose the pipe, um, suppose the pipe is something like this, like, like we have, like we see above. But then the pipe kind of shrinks and now looks like this over here. And so now we're looking at a region maybe like this. So this is our old region right here. Let me go ahead and try and color this again. Um, this, so this. Oh shoot, I did it again. There's a little gap there. Uh, right there. Okay, yeah, it should be good now. Okay, so this is our region from before right here. So this is our delta L. Same pressure here. Same cross-sectional area here. But now let's go ahead and subscript. Let's put a subscript of a one. Okay, subscript this with a one. Now suppose we were to track this fluid through the pipe, okay? So if we did work to move the fluid, we want to follow that fluid through the pipe. Okay. Now, if the fluid, uh, if the fluid flows through the pipe, um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> Okay, yeah, so if the fluid throws, flows through the pipe, there's going to be a pressure on the other end of the pipe here, call it P2, and that fluid that we had in the beginning portion of the pipe over here, this fluid, has now moved through the pipe, so we'll draw it like this, where now this fluid is not here anymore, now it's 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 pushed other fluid through the pipe. So you can imagine some of the fluid coming out of the other end of the pipe. So now we're missing some fluid. Um, this uh, pipe has an amount of fluid delta L2 with a cross-sectional area A2. Okay, so we could see this as maybe the, um, as a portion of the fluid uh, later down in the pipe. And we've done, and, and some work is done by the pressure in the fluid to push some of that fluid through the pipe. And now we're looking at a stage later in the pipe where we have um, a similar situation where we have, a, again, a pressure, and then there's a cross sectional area for that pipe, and then there's a, um, a displacement of that fluid, delta L2. And um, the amount of fluid that is in this section of pipe is the same as the amount of fluid that is in the first section of the pipe. So let me, um, let me write that. Um, so here, so for this region here, the work done on this section uh, of fluid is going to be now with a minus sign 
because the pressure is in the opposite direction here now. P2 is, is against the flow of the fluid, whereas over here P1 is in the same direction as the flow of the fluid. So minus uh, P2 A2 delta L2. Okay. Okay, and the import, one of the important um, things that comes about um, from this is that when the pipe has a bigger cross-sectional area, the velocity of the fluid in the pipe is smaller than the velocity uh, of the fluid in the pipe when the cross-section is smaller. So the velocity V2 uh, is bigger. So I can say V1 is less than V2. And V1 is less than V2. And we can actually, as a matter of fact, this is something uh, I believe this is described um, in the previous section, actually, um, why this is the case. Um, it has to do with the uh, like conservation of, um, of mass, so it's the, the flow rate here. Um, the amount of fluid that flows uh, through for an incompressible fluid has to be the same. Um, let me see if I can find that really quickly. Um, yeah, right here, uh, section 10-8. Um, <clears throat> the uh, mass flow rate. Um, so they uh, describe why the velocity changes as you um, shrink the portion of uh, the pipe here. So the flow rate of mass or mass flow rate, I should say, mass flow rate um, is defined as an amount of mass that flows through a portion of the pipe in a given amount of time, delta T. For an incompressible fluid like water, for example, um, not like gasoline, like gasoline is not an incompressible fluid. Um, so this wouldn't apply in that situation, but for a lot of fluids, they are incompressible. Um, you can write the mass as density times uh, volume. So the density one times volume one, maybe as it flows through a pipe, divided by delta t must be equal to then um, row one and then break the volume down into a cross-sectional area of the pipe times um, an amount of length element there for the pipe, delta L1. And since we're talking about mass flow rate, we have delta L1 over delta T. And so delta L1 over delta T is like the velocity of the fluid. It's the distance the fluid travels inside of the pipe, okay? So we can look at this exactly how we looked. Um, we, can, uh, we can look at this equation here, this rho one, A1, V1, in the context of what we've drawn up here. Okay. And we can see that, okay, in this region of volume here, the fluid is flowing with velocity V1. 
And if we change the cross-sectional area, maybe to half the cross-sectional area that we started with, then our velocity must double to compensate. So the flow rate over here would have to be twice as much, okay? Um, the reason for that is just simply conservation of mass. We have a total amount of mass inside of the pipe that's flowing per second across um, some cross section of the pipe. And that has to be constant. If you think about that, if I put, um, you know, if, if I, let's say I have one mole of water molecules and one mole of water molecules flows through this large cross sectional area here. Okay. If I make the pipe smaller, in order for me to fit one mole of water molecules through that section of the pipe, which is now thinner, I would have to move those particles through faster. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be able to fit one mole of them through in the same amount of time. And so the fluid then would start to compress um, near A2. It would, it would not be incompressible. It would start to compress. Um, and so uh, from the mass flow rate idea that uh, mass flow rate must be conserved here, mass must be conserved for an incompressible fluid, the, there can't be any buildup, um, it can't get any more dense, then we have the statement that um, rho 2 A2 V2 must be the same as rho 1 um, A1 V1. And then like I said, if we have an incompressible fluid, if incompressible, rho one has to be equal to rho two. So if we're talking about water in a pipe, nowhere in the pipe is the density of water gonna change. So we can cancel those and we have that A2 V2 is equal to a1 v1 so that explains why the velocity changes um, the velocity of the fluid will change if you change the cross-sectional area okay so change the cross-sectional area maybe you cut it in half then you double the velocity so how does this relate over here to the what we were talking about before with the works well if work is being done on the fluid in the pipe then we can make a statement about the energy, the change in energy for the, um, the fluid, okay? Um, and the way we do that is we, again, we consider the pressures on the ends of the pipe and we account for the kinetic energy um, of the fluid and we account for the amount of work that's done by the uh, pressure in the fluid. So let's write all this down. So we have work being done. We have plus the kinetic energy of the fluid. And then we have any gravitational potential energy that might be there in the fluid as well. So, um, so the energy uh, in the fluid um, uh, I should probably be more precise about how I write this down. So this is kind of like the idea. This is kind of like the idea that we want here. So we want to sum up all the energies, but we have to be more precise. We have to say in a particular way, we have to say that um, the uh, change in kinetic energy of the fluid, if the fluid starts with velocity V1 here, and velocity v2 over here, then there's a change in kinetic energy, right? So um, work is equal to the change in, um, in, in energy here, which we could, we could say is the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy for any um, conservative forces that are involved here, like gravity, for example, we can define the potential energy and so if we account for all of the works that are being done here, we have, uh, what was it, P1, 
uh, P1, A1, delta L1. So P1, A1, delta L1 um, minus P2, uh, A2, delta L2. And that's got to be equal to one half M V1 squared, M1 V1 squared, uh, a change in kinetic energy. So that's the initial kinetic. So one half uh, m um, uh, final v final squared. Um, and for an incompressible fluid, actually, we don't need to account for. Um, well, actually, I'll, so actually, we do need that there. So never mind. So I, I put mass final there for reasons that I'll show in a second. Uh, minus one half um, m initial v initial squared, um, and then any change in potential energy there as well. As a matter of fact, there should be um, there should be a uh, minus sign here um, because uh, if you do work to change the potential energy, it's always minus the change in potential energy. So it should be minus the change in potential energy here. So that would be a minus uh, potential energy final would be something like M final, <coughs> excuse me, uh, G H final minus M initial G H initial to account for any change in height um, for the fluid. So for example, here, the height changes. You could just look at the center though. Look at the two centers. So there's the, there's the center there. I kind of messed up the straight line there. Um, and then here's the other center right here. So here's a distance H. So here's our, um, our statement here. And now we can make a couple changes to make things a lot uh, nicer. So I can, um, I can take this equation here and replace the masses uh, with densities for an incompressible fluid here. Um, the, uh, the density will not change. And so um, that it's nice to actually put the, the densities in here. And so what would the final expression be? Um, the final expression here, if we replace the masses with densities, um, and we divide through by these quantities here. Um, I see, let me think about this. Um, okay, so if we have, ah, yes. Yeah, so if we, have a, if we have an incompressible fluid, A1 delta L1 is equal to A2 delta L2. So we can write then that this is simply equal to the volume of the uh, segment. So let's call it delta V here. This is just a volume element of, uh, of the fluid inside the pipe. So if we do that, then our expression simplifies greatly. So uh, P1 delta V minus P2 uh, delta V um, is equal to one half. Um, and again, it's the same amount of mass in these, um, it's the same amount of mass in these uh, uh, pieces of, of the pipe here uh, when we have an incompressible fluid. If the density was not constant, which is basically what we're saying right here, this is for an incompressible fluid, the density remains constant, then we would, in principle, we could have different amounts of masses in each of those volume elements. But since it's, we're assuming it to be incompressible, we will not have that. Um, v initial squared minus M G H final plus distributing the minus sign there, M G H initial, and then divide everything by Delta V. We have P one minus P two equals one half rho V final squared minus one half rho V initial squared uh, minus rho um, G H final plus rho G H initial. Okay, 
So it took us a while to get there, but now the magic kind of starts. I shouldn't have, as a matter of fact, I had P1 and P2 here, but I put final and initial. Now I'll go ahead and change these finals and initials to ones and twos, just to sync up the notation here a little bit. So um, it would be two minus one here, and then it would be uh, negative two uh, plus one there. Um, now the magic happens because what we're saying is um, that if we group all of the initial terms, so every term with a one on one side of the equation, one half row v one squared, and then minus one, uh, no, uh, minus rho g h1. This has to be equal to p2, now grouping all the two terms on the other side, plus one half rho v2 squared uh, minus rho g h2. And you can see that everything on the left hand side looks exactly like everything on the right hand side except you have to replace the subscript one with the subscript two. So this is really a statement of the initial energy. It's actually not energy, it's, it's, it's actually uh, energy density, um, but we'll just, we'll just pretend it's energy here. The initial energy is equal to the final energy, okay? So Bernoulli is really a statement of conservation of energy. So Bernoulli, how do I spell his name? Is it two L's? Yeah, Bernoulli. So Bernoulli's uh, equation or Bernoulli's principle, whatever, uh, is conservation of energy for fluids. Okay, we have a statement, something initial equals something final. And so um, one more thing that you could do is you could say, okay, so the pressure plus one half the density uh, times the velocity squared plus the density times GH, this is equal to some constant, right? Because this thing is not gonna change with time. This thing is not going to change with time. And this is true at every point, uh, at every location in the fluid. Every single location inside that pipe um, where the fluid is located, this statement is true. Okay. Um, if you have a situation where um, the cross section of the pipe is uh, the same. So for example, if I scroll back up here, if I have a situation like this, I have this pipe right here. If I have a situation like this, where I have this pipe right here, I can imagine um, I can imagine a situation where the uh, the cross sectional area of the pipe does not change, but the fluid is moving um, not only horizontally but it's also moving uh, vertically as well. And so um, in this situation, the velocity of the fluid is like this, and it's constant. This is the initial height, and this is the final height. When the velocity is constant like this, then we don't have to worry about the velocity term here when we go to calculate the, um, the initial and final energies because, um, or the change in energy rather, because this term drops out of the difference. So if I wanted to compare the initial energy I could just say P1 plus rho GH1 is equal to P2 plus rho GH2. 
where I have a pressure P1 over here or P initial. And I have a, a yeah, let's just say one. I keep changing from initial to final. Um, let's use uh, let's use one and two here. And I have a pressure P2 over here. Um, so uh, the, the, the term with the velocity squared doesn't come into the equation because it would cancel out on both sides, right? Um, if I just had one half rho v squared on one side and one half rho v squared on the other side, it would just drop out. And so from this, we can, we can say that uh, P2 minus P1, the difference in pressure is equal to um, rho g and then uh, h2 minus h1, which is something that we've seen already, right? We've seen this equation before, but now it comes as a consequence of conservation uh, of energy, right? And, um, you know, the, the same thing is true. So, for example, if I have a pipe where um, it's like this, it's kind of, um, it's thick here, and then it kind of comes in like this, and now it's thin in this region, um, then the velocity will change, but the height of the center of mass um, for each section of the pipe is at the same height. Then what happens is we have P2 minus P1 uh, is equal to, um, it would be the difference in a one half rho V2 squared minus one half rho V1 squared. And this is now, now this is like a new expression that we haven't seen yet. But uh, in addition to that, of course, um, we can replace the velocities. Um, we can figure out what the velocities are based on the cross-sectional area, right? So I could even come in here and replace V2 with something like uh, V1, um, uh, V1, A1 over A2, right? And then I could uh, factor some stuff out and manipulate the equation a little bit, but we won't do that because I've already been talking here for quite a long time. We're already over the 10 o'clock and I um, do want to give you guys, um, do want to give you guys a couple questions um, to actually get a feel. Um, so for Bernoulli's principle, um, I would, uh, I would give you guys this, uh, this equation here on, um, on a test, this one in particular, just so you know which one I'm giving you, I would give you this equation here, or excuse me, not that one. Um, I would give you an equation like this one right here. So it has all of the terms in it and you just have to figure out, okay, which terms are zero for my particular question. Because a formula like this is, it's kind of, it's, it's tough to, to remember, okay. All right, so um, I would like to not just end things, even though we're over time, I'd like to actually go over some random test questions like you guys wanted to see. Um, so maybe I'll do three um, and I'll kind of just go over them. Um, kind of quickly so we can uh, so we're not here all night. So in order to do that, I have to clear this. I have to get a new screen here for us. So everything um, is gone now. And I will copy a question over here. A uniform 1200 Newton piece of medical apparatus that is 3.5 meters long is suspended horizontally by two vertical wires at its ends. A small but dense 550 Newton weight is placed on the apparatus 2.0 meters from one end as shown in the figure. I'll get the figure here in a second so we can all see that. What are the tensions A and B in the two wires? Let me grab the figure. 
here's the figure right here. I'll enlarge that. Hopefully it's not too blurry. I think that's good enough. I think we can read that. Um, so they want to know what the tension is in the wires A and B. So how do we go about figuring that out? Well, first off, the medical apparatus has a weight, 1200 newtons, that acts right at the center. And that was not a very good line there. So we have 1200 newtons acting right there at the center. Um, if we want to figure out the uh, tension in each of these um, wires, then we'll have to apply the equations of static equilibrium. Okay. There's another mass here, 550 newtons at that location. And so if we were to sum all of the forces in the y direction, taking the upward direction to be positive, all of those forces should be equal to zero in order to maintain static equilibrium. So that means that the force A plus the force B, they're both uh, vertical forces here. Both of these forces are in the uh, upward direction, I mean, so they're both positive, minus uh, adding these two forces here, we get 1,750 newtons acting downward. So I'll put a minus sign and that has to be equal to zero. That tells us that FA plus FB has to be equal to the total weight of everything added up here. So 1,750 newtons. All right, now we need to handle the torques. So you only need to calculate the torque about the most convenient point. And I would say that the most convenient point here is to calculate the torque about the point B because they're giving us this distance of two meters here, which is gonna be the lever arm for the 550 Newton force. So to sum up all of the torques, I will take the counterclockwise direction to be positive. All of these, the sum of torques should be equal to zero for static equilibrium. There is no torque due to the force FB because I've chosen the pivot point right here to be at that point at the, at the location where the force B is acting. And so we don't need to worry about that. We have a down, a, a, a counterclockwise torque due to the 1200 Newton force and a counterclockwise torque due to the 550 Newton force. So those will be 1200 uh, Newtons times this distance right here, which is one half of 3.5. So I'll write it in the expression as one half of 3.5. So maybe it's a little bit easier looking back at it. You can remember why it's gonna be 1.75. Um, 3.5 over two is 1.75. Um, and then plus 550 newtons times this two meters here that they give us. And then of course, minus FA times its lever arm, which is the full 3.5 meters there. And this should be equal to zero. So we can start multiplying some numbers together the 1200 times the 3.5 over two plus the 550 times two. And we end up with 3200 here. So 3200 Newtons is equal to 3.5 times FA. So we can now divide the 3200 by 3.5. And we end up with 914 Newtons. So FA is approximately uh, 914 Newtons. I'm just rounding that off there. And that allows us to calculate what FB is. So FB from this expression over here on the left is equal to the 1750 Newtons 
minus the 914 newtons here. So just double check on your calculators as well to make sure that I haven't made a mistake, right? So 1750 minus that 914 gives us about 836 newtons. So FB is uh, 836 and FA is 914. So we go over to the answers that are, uh, since these are multiple choice questions, we can take a look at the answers here and they give 840 newtons for FB and 910 newtons for FA. And I look at all the answers here and I can see, yep, it's definitely this one. They've just rounded to two significant figures, which makes sense because they have two here, they have two here, they have two here, and they have two there as well. Um, so yeah, any questions about that one? Thank you for the Bernoulli's. Yeah, it's a little bit long winded though. So I hope it's helpful. Um, anyways, any questions about this one here? Okay, I'll start prepping the next question. You can let I me know. If, yeah, go ahead. Um, when we are when we were getting the net torque, mm -hmm. um, you said uh, FA times 3.5 is a torque like there, um, why don't we use the center of mass? Like... FA is the force that's acting right here at the edge of the rod. Right, but um, for, for L, you use 3.5 instead of 3.5 over two. Is there any reason for that? Yeah, because the, the pivot point that we're calculating the torque about is here and the distance from that point to the force FA is the full distance of the rod, the full length of the rod, right? Only the mass, which is this one, only the, the weight of the object acts at the center of mass. The force FA does not act at the center of mass. I see. Thank Does you. that make sense? Yep. Okay. So, so you're good then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so then, and then also, right, this other, the other block that's there is not at the center. The only one that's at the center of mass is the weight. Okay. So I, I've grabbed another question here. Um, where did it go? Um, uh, this one right here. So let me just read the question real quick. So a 100 kilogram, so a 100 kilogram person sits on a five kilogram bicycle, the total <coughs> weight is borne equally by the two wheels of the bicycle. The tires are 2.0 centimeters wide and are inflated to a gauge pressure of 8.0 times 10 to the fifth pascals. What length of each tire is in contact with the ground. Okay. To determine the answer here, the first thing that we need to recognize is kind of what we already talked about, where we have, if we have a tire like this, and there's a portion of the tire which is in contact with the ground, then the force, the upward force there, is gonna be equal to the pressure times the area, right? And then of course we have the total weight acting downward, okay? 
So weight has to be equal to two times the pressure times the area because we have two tires. There are two tires for a bicycle, right? Not four. The area here, they tell us that it's two centimeters wide, so 0.02 centimeters wide times some length that we don't know yet. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's what we're trying to solve for. What length of each tire is in contact with the ground? Okay, so the bicycle is 500 kilograms and the person is 100 kilograms, so the total mass um, that we need to take account for is 105 kilograms. And to get the weight, we multiply by G, right? The gauge pressure is the only pressure that we care about in this problem because, of course, we have atmospheric pressure on the outside of the tire and atmospheric pressure on the inside of the tire. So that really just cancels um, each other out. So in order to solve for the length here, we can first analytically solve. So the weight is going to be mg. We're going to have to divide that by two times the pressure to get the area of the tire that makes contact with the ground. So at this, I would recommend at this point kind of plugging things in and then maybe dividing. Oh, sorry, I, I said 0.02 centimeters. I meant 0.02 meters. And then in the end, we'll just divide our answer by 0.02 meters to get the length. So that would be 105 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, right? Divided by twice the pressure, which is eight times 10 to the fifth, I believe. Yes, 8.0 times 10 to the fifth uh, Newton per meter squared. Go ahead and plug that into the calculator. 105 times 9.8 divided by 2 times 8 times 10 to the 5. And we end up with uh, 0.000643. That's enough significant figures. Um, for me, that's meters squared. And then we need to take that answer and divide it by 0.02 meters to get L. So L equals this thing here. So divide this by 0.02. And we end up with point, where's my mouse? There it is, 0.03 uh, meters. Okay, so uh, a two centimeter by three centimeter uh, portion of the tires uh, wheels are making contact with the ground. That seems a little small to me, um, but that is the correct answer. A um, 100 kilogram person is a pretty big person. That's like 220 pounds. Um, so you would think the tire uh, would be making more contact. And of course, the reason that when we go to calculate that it's not is because they've given us a, a really um, a really big uh, uh, gauge pressure here for the tire. So um, yeah. So the answer, so the correct answer there was uh, roughly three centimeters. Uh, I think, yeah, exactly. The exact answer is 3.2 centimeters there. So if we round, we'll, uh, we'll lose a little bit of accuracy there. But that is the correct answer. Okay, and let's do one more for good measure here. We'll do a question from uh, chapter 11. Let's try this one, let's see. Okay, maybe this is one I can ask um, to you and maybe you guys can answer it. So if we have a simple pendulum, a 
simple pendulum having a bob of mass m has a period t if you double m but change nothing else what would be the new period and they give four choices here they give two uh, t over square root of two so this was a answer b they give uh, t so the same answer c they give t over two answer d they give um, I think they mean t times square root 2, but it kind of looks like t raised to the power square root 2, which that's, yeah, I think it's just like it just looks strange in mastering. Um, and then e is 2t, so twice the period. So a simple pendulum having a bob mass of m has a period t. If you double m but change nothing else, what would be the new period? I'll give you guys like 30 seconds to think about that. So 30 seconds to think about that there. If you're watching the recording, you should also try to come up with your answer. Another 15 seconds. Okay, those of you who are with me, can you put your answers in the chat? Put your answers in the chat now, please. Okay, so let's discuss it now. Um, so here's what we have to remember. We have to remember that the period of a pendulum depends on a few things, okay? In particular, it's proportional to the square root of L over G, the length of the pendulum and the gravitational acceleration G. If you want to make this an equation, you put a 2 pi here. So it's 2 pi square root uh, L over G. But if you can just remember the, the square root L over G part, that's pretty good to, to answer this question. Um, this tells us immediately that T does not depend on the mass, right? So it does not depend on mass. And therefore, changing the mass does nothing to the period. And so the correct answer would be B. Okay. All right, that's where we're gonna wrap things up. Um, so it's uh, 10.30, so we got like a half hour over, which is fine. Hopefully you guys got something out of this. Um, do take a look at all of those questions in that review assignment because all the questions in the review assignment are multiple choice questions so they're going to be very similar to questions that I ask you on the test, right? And I may even copy some questions, right? Who knows? I could copy some questions directly into the test. Um, so you definitely want to go and take a look at those. And um, there's 55 questions there, so plenty of practice, right? Maybe do, uh, um, maybe do uh, maybe like 20 questions a night, and then you should be ready to go by Monday, by Monday night for our exam. Okay, so I'll see you on Monday.